So on with part two of week six, module seven's lecture on representing race, black, African-American, U.S. Uh, women artists and feminism. We're looking now uh, at the work on the screen by Carrie Mae Weems. Uh, Carrie Mae Weems, Lorna Simpson, and Carl Walker, who are the last three artists I'll be covering, come from a little bit later generation than the artists that we've seen to, so far. So if I were to recap some of the key kinds of strategies and issues that these artists so far have covered, uh, and it's pretty kind of indicative of artists who grew up in the 60s and 70s and began producing in the 70s or 80s, we see, for instance, an interest, again, something that's parallel to first-generation feminism in various ways, of seeking out um, kind of the persistence of cultural or ethnic forms that predate the colonial period. This starts with artists such as Lois Milou Jones uh, in her, her work, as well, as well as Betty Sarr's work. We also see this in Faith Ringgold's work as well. We also see, and this is very common, a kind of aggressive attitude taken towards uh, trying to get white culture to confront its own prejudices by pointing out various forms of stereotypes that uh, persist in the current day. Now, this isn't just about making white culture confront these stereotypes. It's also, of course, about uh, allowing uh, people of various ethnicities to think their way through or reflect upon the way that they have internalized these types of stereotypes or think of themselves through these forms of representation that started with majority culture and then were um, you know, used to frame uh, black culture in this case. Uh, and so we see that particularly in Adrian Piper's work. We also see uh, works of art that are meant to exhort uh, women artists of color to take risks, to actually not play that zero-sum game, or to find themselves, you know, trying to uh, play a game that has been set up by white culture in artistry and is instead, uh, you know, deal with the social inequities that they confront their everyday experience in their own works of art. Adrian Piper does this, Lorraine Grady does this, and so forth. With this slightly younger generation of artists, um, we see an approach that is, I think, more in line with something that occurred in Adrian P Piper's Funk Lessons, uh, a way of, you know, on the one hand, representing oneself to the world and inviting a majority cultures, white cultures, to um, intimately kind of experience the 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 history of black culture. And that's certainly the case with the work that you see on the screen here. This is one of a series, many, many photographs of Carrie Mae Weems uh, that are accompanied with, with verbiage. She almost always captions her works um, that are known as the uh, Family Pictures and Story series. These are photographs taken from her own family albums over four generations of her family, uh, starting with something that is very common for uh, for black experience, the, the series of migrations from the South to the North that started post-Civil War and continued all the way through the 60s and even sometimes into the present, um, in which what she's doing is she's trying to counter the way that black culture is represented by the dominant white culture. Uh, it's something that we see a lot of black artists doing even today as well. One of the, the first things that really struck a chord with her, and it's a, a common uh, uh, kind of um, historical, uh, um, what do I want to say, a, a common um, point of reference for many black artists is a famous report uh, from the 1960s known as the Moynihan Report on the, the difficulty that black families were experiencing in inner cities. Now, this was a report that was commissioned by the United States government. It was extremely well-intentioned. It was meant to deal with the problem of the black family and why racial inequities still um, were to be found everywhere and the, the way that uh, black culture in itty, uh, inner cities uh, continue to experience uh, both racial uh, um, 
um, racial issues as well as class issues, why black culture wasn't flourishing. And, and you know, to in that way, again, very well intentioned, meant to, to deal with the problems of black culture and to integrate them into, uh, the, you know, the kind of American dream. The problem, as many um, black, both literary theorists as well as artists pointed out, was that it took the model of the white nuclear family as kind of the the best um, the best kind of family unit, and it juxtaposed black uh, culture with that idea of the white nuclear family and found it wanting. Um, so, for instance, uh, the idea of a, a husband and wife, um, you know, living together with their children was something that Patrick Moynihan pointed out was not very prevalent in black culture, where the, the husband was all, oftentimes missing, whether that be through incarceration or through just not being around. And this led to the black woman of the family, the matriarch, as he put it, um, needing to um, needing to kind of take the family leadership role, which demasculinized uh, young black males and led to all kinds of problems in their family. So it was, uh, again, kind of judging black families based upon the precedent of the, the typical or prototypical white male family and finding it lacking in various ways and ascribing the major problems of black culture to this lack of a, a nuclear family. There are other things that people took issue with in this report, but that's one of the big ones. And as many people pointed out, you know, th there's not just one type of family that works. There are many different kinds of families and the Moynihan report uh, didn't take into account, for instance, intergenerational families, uh, you know, Older black men, maybe not the father, but an uncle or a grandfather providing that role for young black men. Or, you know, multiple different women in the family, not just one matriarch, mothers and sisters and grandmothers and so forth, helping uh, a family to thrive. It tended to neglect, of course, all of the problems of the persistence of racism uh, in the world, which was another thing that many uh, critics pointed to. The big thing, though, that Carrie Mae Weems wanted to deal with was the way that black culture is more often than not represented by majority culture and the importance of self-representation uh, of the experience of black culture. And so to do that, she took pictures that are from her family albums that are both, you know, good pictures meaning glorify black life and also pictures that kind of show some of the difficulties of black life and she captioned them with verbiage that helped uh, you know both black and white cultures to engage with the history of her family uh, and to see both differences as well as similarities in their own experience here. So we see here two black women kind of coming towards us and it, it sets us up pretty interestingly uh, whether we be white or black, as an intimate, um, you know, addressee. We're being uh, talked to, uh, embraced by these black women and feel a part of this scene and kind of get a sense of, uh, at least this was the goal, of what it would be like to be a part of this culture rather than seeing this culture as other if we happen not to be uh, a black viewer in this situation. I'll just show you a couple of pictures from this. She also confronts in these pictures various racial stereotypes, which of course we know stereotypes don't come out of the blue. Sometimes they are, um, you know, they're something that come from some kind of minor facts that are then blown into kind of grand proportions and, um, and we start to see uh, other cultures through these lenses. Now they're partially true in some cases, but of course they are always simplifications of the realities um, that they represent. In this case, this is her dad. And on the left hand, it says, Daddy with Suzy Q number one. And on the right, it says, Daddy with Suzy Q number two. It's partaking of the stereotype as the black player, you know, the black ladies man. And it says in the middle, Daddy is a ladies man. The women just love him. He's got so many, he calls them all Suzy Q, so he won't have to remember one name. Now this offers up for us, uh, you know, an image of a stereotype that we can reflect upon and think about. Um, now, he may be a player, he may be a stereotype, but there's so much 
kind of um, specificity in these images, so much kind of intimacy that we're being allowed in to see that we don't just, I hope, reduce him to the stereotype of the black ladies' man. Or this, you know, the, the pregnant black woman, always pregnant uh, in her interior. It says, Alice, is you pregnant again, girl? Or just images that she's offering up of her life, a kind of intimate insider look, a form of self-representation of the generations of her family, which we, uh, you know, reflect upon, dependent upon our own life experiences, both as blacks and whites and everything else that, that we may come to this with in order to see and experience someone representing their own history for us to think about. One of our most famous photo series is a series called the Kitchen Table Series, which is basically a, a photo essay of a, uh, a narrative of a black woman's life. And you're seeing three of the images from this series here. They all kind of go in chronological order. At the beginning, we have the young, very successful, very ambitious black woman. She's got all kinds of hopes and dreams. And the reason we know this is that these things are captioned, not immediately below the picture. This is important. The captions or the little narratives uh, that are written are on wall plaques that may be you know, 10, 15 feet off to the side. And we have to spend some time kind of trying to figure out which caption and which narrative actually goes with which image and think our way through and construct that narrative ourselves. In any case, she starts off ambitious, hopeful for her future, thinking about her own desires and her own goals in life. She falls in love with a, uh, a very charismatic black man. They talk about their dreams and hopes for the future. And over the course of this photo essay, we see their intimacy unfold, we read about it in the wall text, and then we start to note that her compromises that she is making as a woman, and even more importantly as a black woman, in this kind of dynamic of the black family, uh, start to wear upon her. Her dreams and her desires take second seat to his and to the family, it's including, you know, scenes such as this. Um, stop here, pause, and just look at this image for a minute and decode it. You know, spend some time thinking about all of the imagery that is in here and what it makes you think about, how you read this image itself. This is an important component of all of these works, of course, in these these, uh, you know, uh, video lectures that I'm giving you, I hope you're stopping to look at these carefully and do your own kind of analysis of these works as well as listen to what I have to say about them. Uh, it's much easier to do that in a classroom environment sometimes. Um, but in this case, just pause and look at this and think about what you think the narrative is here. So one of the things that stands out to me is how Clearly, this image partakes of stereotypes about black families or interactions of black women and black men. It's something that I've seen any number of times. It's in numerous movies. It's in books all over the place. We see her as his intimate lover also kind of functioning in the role of almost a maternal nurturing mother as well. He's, one presumes, come home from work. She's made the big, beautiful meal for him. He has devoured his lobster and is continued, continuing to kind of, you know, love the taste of that while she, you know, comforts him and revels in his, uh, in his uh, you know, pleasure here that she has given to him. He has been drinking heavily. He's at least three Budweiser's down and most of a glass of wine down where as far as we can tell, she has touched nothing. His goals kind of come first here. On the table in front of us, we see cards. This actually references an earlier image in the work in which, you know, the game playing that occurs in relationships is um, at least implicitly noticed. And then 
in the foreground, we see a three of hearts that may be an indication of why this special meal is taking place. We'll read in photo essays that she has become pregnant and maybe this is the announcement of the start of that family that he is all want, always wanted. In the upper left hand side, we see a bird cage uh, and in that bird cage, a bird. Um, maybe referencing the way that she is trapped in this situation of her own choosing in a sense, um, although not entirely. And it always makes me think of the famous uh, you know, book by Maya Angelou, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, which would be a very common reference point for any number of black artists of this time period. As the photo essay unfolds, we see the child now and the mother and some of the photo essay tells about her struggles uh, in the situation in which she's continually finding herself having to compromise her own aspirations and goals and desires uh, for the, the family and for the husband. And I put together here this image with this text that you would find on the wall, which reads, neither knew with certainty what the future held it could be only a paper moon hanging aboard a cardboard sea, but they both said it wouldn't be make-believe if you believed in me. He wanted children. She didn't. At the height of their love, a child was born. Her sisters thought the world of their children, noting their little feet as they stumbled, teetered, and stood. When her kid finally stood and watched, walked, she watched with a distant eye, thinking, Thank God I won't have to carry her much longer. Oh yeah, she loved the kid. She was responsible, but took no deep pleasure in motherhood. It caused a deflection from her own immediate desires, which pissed her off. Ha, a woman's duty. Ha, a punishment for Eve's sin was more like it. Ha. As the essay unfolds, photo essay that is, uh, they break up. Um, you know, the tensions get too much, her, her compromises get too much, she seeks out the support of her friends, who in this case comfort her. In a way, this experience, which is being told through black experience, is something that I suppose all of us can universally understand, and that's one of the pulls of Carrie Mae Ween's work. It is specific to black culture. It partakes in various kinds of stereotypes or norms within black culture, but it also opens itself up, just as the family pictures and stories series did, to our own reflection. We can, in some ways, uh, identify with what we see. We can identify with the roles. And we can also note the places that we don't identify, where that experience is not the same as our own where our own uh, you know, experiences differ from that which we are seeing. A classmate of Carrie Mae Weems at UC San Diego is Lorna Simpson, a little older if I remember correctly, uh, who is of these artists that we've seen so far, the most versed in postmodern and post-structuralist theory. Um, the image that you're looking at on the screen here is called Guarded Conditions. And again, this is a place for you to do some analysis. What you're looking at are six, what is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, a number of, <laughs> a number of Polaroids, that, and that's important. It's a Polaroid picture in large scale that have been uh, printed in different component parts of a black woman wearing a servant's um, kind of ship uh, seen from the back um, with very little information given to us about who this person is or what we're to make of this image. But then below this, we see repeated over and again the terms sex attacks, skin attacks, sex attacks, skin attacks. This is meant to note the double marginalization of black women, both attacked or prejudiced against for their gender as well as their race, something that all women of color have to confront in some way, um, depending upon their circumstances. The image, of course, of all these women, it's the same woman, 
repeated over and over again and compartmentalized into these different frames, meant to reference, I believe, the idea of race and gender as a construct, one through which we see others, right? The Polaroid is referenced because the Polaroid camera was the first method by which, of course, mug shots and police profiles were taken. They're one singular image, and she wants to reference surveillance culture, racial profiling, the way that we see through stereotypes. But she also wants us to perform our own reading, kind of fall into the role of the surveyor of this woman, try to make sense of who she is through the little, you know, cues that we're given. So what information are we given? Well, one, her skin color, right? That she's black. Two, that she's a woman. Two major ways through which we see her. Three, things like her hair, her hairstyle. How does that reference her ethnicity? Four, something that looks like a servant's gown referencing the history of slavery and servitude of black women that persists even today. And then behind her back, we see these hands. What are we to make of those? She hiding her hands from the person who's in front of her? Is the black fist meant to be a black power salute? How are we to understand all of this? We need to make sense of it and reflect on the ways that we are making sense of this in the same way in some sense that Cindy Sherman was asking us to make sense of the stereotypes that we saw. The final thing that is very important about this is the way that the title works. Guarded. Guarded by whom? Is she guarded? Is she acting guarded? Is she withholding some form of self-representation because she fears the way that it will be understood by someone else? Is she guarded in the sense that, you know, blacks are guarded by uh, majority culture? How do we understand that here? Why is she turned away from us? What does that do? When she doesn't look back out at us, how are we to think of this? Is she withholding? Is she refusing to be represented by us to partake in this reciprocal relationship of self and other margin and center? Those are all questions that this artist wants to bring up. Just one more work by Lorna Simpson. Again, pause here and seek to uh, decode this image, to give meaning to this image. What you see is this, it doesn't come across in this, um, this slide presentation, but it's a beautiful image of, again, the black woman turned away from us, wearing a servant's uh, garb, holding in one hand a plastic water pitcher and in the other hand a silver water pitcher from which in each case water is being poured out. Then beneath this the verbiage, uh, she saw him disappear by the river. They asked her to tell what happened only to discount her memory. Pause and think what narrative is is unfolding for you here. What does all of this mean? One thing that many people have pointed out, and the first to do this was Bell Hooks, whose reading I gave you, is that in this verbiage, and I'll come back to the pronouns that are used here, what we what is implied is that she has a certain amount of knowledge that someone in a position of authority is asking for her to give to them. And when she gives that knowledge to them, wherever, you know, however he disappeared, she knows, she offers that knowledge to them, they don't listen to her. They don't accept what she offers up. Why they don't accept is up, up to us to figure out. Is it because she's black? Is it because it doesn't fit with the narrative that they've come to this in advance with? In any case, they don't accept this knowledge. They don't accept her story. Bell Hooks called this subjugated knowledge. A sub subjugated knowledge for Bell Hooks is a type of knowledge that people in minority cultures have that majority cultures don't accept. It's when in that essay that I gave you, she points to the margin as a place of knowledge, a place of power, a place that majority cultures can't go, although minority cultures can pass from the margin to the center. They don't accept these knowledges as something 
uh, that fits within their own scheme of things, their own understanding of the world. In this case, though, unlike, for instance, me, who anytime I'm confronted with someone who doesn't agree with what I say or I've got some, you know, I've got some firsthand information about something and I tell that and to someone and they say, no, I don't, I don't believe what you have to say or Frankly, this happens with my kids all the time, right? So my daughter will say, this is what happened. And my son will go ballistic. He's younger and say, no, 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 that's not what happened at all. It's this way and get really angry about it. This wo woman does not seek to change the mind of the oppressor. It does not change the mind of the person in the position of authority. She simply releases her burden. That leads us to the water here and the title, the water barrier bearer refers to the idea of carrying someone's water, an old adage. To carry someone's water is to carry someone else's burden. To, in this case, um, to carry the burden of the truth that you have and try to convince someone else of that truth. She's not going to do that. She's not going to reciprocate. She doesn't need to convince the people that don't accept her story as truth as the real truth as she sees it. She's just releasing it. She will maintain her own knowledge of things without trying to seek to change other people's position here. The uh, image, of course, harks back to a figure of justice, the weighing of scales and the whole idea of social justice here. Further, it the, references the idea of the persistence of raci racism and racial inequities on the uh, Left-hand side is the silver pitcher, going back to kind of earlier uh, moments of U.S. history, particularly, uh, you know, uh, old uh, plantation culture where silverware was uh, something that was only afforded by the rich. And on the right is a more common, conventional, contemporary form of carrying water, the plastic pitcher. So we see an entire history here represented where things haven't changed. Furthermore, though, we see the idea of class. Those silver pitchers and the silver trade uh, in the United States, which is one of our earliest forms of very uh, extolled craftsmanship, was a, a, a luxury item that was afforded primarily, not exclusively, but primarily associated with plantation culture and slave culture. And of course, that economy of the United States only got going, could only kind of sustain itself with free work, the work that was performed by slaves. Today, uh, over on the right-hand side, you see the plastic picture, much more associated with throwaway culture and contemporary culture and, and so forth, um, and may reference such things as low class and, uh, you know, and not having equal access to wealth that continues to um, play, you know, to uh, to be dealt with by various uh, racial and ethnic minorities. Finally, remember our discussion of Barbara Kruger's pronouns and think about how they operate in the verbiage here. She references the figure here, we suppose. Him is nowhere to be found. We don't know who he is or who he's supposed to refer to. He's no longer here. They, as we found in Barbara Kruger's work, oftentimes references what Emil Bonavis calls the objective, the voice of history, you know, the ubiquitous they that we always refer to when we don't want to specify a source of things, someone who's in a position of authority. The final artist, a very difficult artist, and a very, very hot artist today is Carl Walker. Uh, Carl Walker um, got famous early on for creating these types of installation scenes, which are um, silhouette scenes of cut out um, black construction paper uh, adhered directly to the walls of gallery spaces. The imagery that is in her scenes are scenes uh, and images that she has taken from uh, both uh, slave times, antebellum times, as well as post-slave times, primarily from the South, um, that are just the most overt forms of stereotypical representations of black culture that you can find. 
Um, so they all have an actual objective source, although she manipulates these sources and changes them somewhat so as to turn them into the stereotypical grotesque, right? Push them towards um, violence or overt uh, sexual aggression towards black women and so that we can't accept them as just kind of neutral, uh, nonviolent stereotypes. I'll show you a close-up of one of these. So again, for many of you out there, you may not recognize the racial stereotypes that these works come from. And, and that leads to questions about the legibility of race and stereotypes and what it means if a stereotype, a very, very um, you know, violent stereotype, one that is full of all kinds of racial prejudices, is not something that you recognize, whereas others do. If you've never come across this before, you know, what are we to make of these things? For others of us who have seen these stereotypes before, you know, you'll notice that she is really trying to draw our attention to the persistence of particular stereotypes about black culture here. Before going into what these stereotypes are, though, let's reference what a silhouette is and why she is employing a silhouette. A silhouette, this, you know, what we see here in front of us, is something that imparts a great deal of knowledge or a great deal of information about a figure without going into any specific details, right? So we can recognize these figures, um, but they don't give us any specifics about these figures at all. So they are like visual facsimiles of a stereotype. And like a stereotype, not only are they not specific while seeming to impart a great deal of information, they are literally paper thin, right? They're paper thin. So what are these stereotypes? On the left hand side, we see a figure of a black woman. On the one hand, it looks like something ripped out of a National Geographic full of all types of indications of primitive qualities. The uh, grass skirt, the fly swatter in her hair with a bone handle, the beaded uh, anklet around her, uh, around her ankle here. Uh, no, uh, of course, top on. This is meant to reference for many people the idea of black women being very primitive and very hypersexualized, uh, a notion that again was uh, talked about kind of ad nauseum at the end of the 19th century. And for instance, those of you who have ever seen Manet's Olympia, the black figure in that is a representation of the hypersexualized black woman. She wears on her head a false crown, like she's queen of the jungle, but only in make-believe, and stuffs her hand into her mouth. This is both a reference to aggressive sexuality here, but also, of course, uh, the ill treatment, the over, uh, the, the well, the, the, you know, gagging over this treatment. In front of her, leaning over to do goodness knows what to the, the white figure that's in this, is the young black man, um, again, referenced by his big lips and his Afro hair, who for me harks back to that figure in Little Rascals known as Buttweep. Uh, Buckwheat is not only in Little Rascals. You can find him in any period movie. He's the young black figure who is, um, you know, can't speak English very well, is trying to play the role of the young black or the young white man by wearing his clothes and adopting his speech patterns, but never quite getting it right. And it's always the butt of jokes, which I think is why Eddie Murphy made so much fun of this in his Saturday Night Live skits. Then on the black back of the white male figure, you see what is known as a little pickaninny figure with her braided hair. Um, again, the black bebe, as they're called more often in the 1980s. What he's doing there, putting something into his pants, is again the stereotypical grotesque, and your uh, you know interpretation of that is certainly as good as anything I could make of it. Another of these images. Again, some of these things may be uh, stereotypes that you're familiar with. The Spanish moss in the trees up above sets the whole scene in the south. Over on the left-hand side, if you've ever seen or recently seen period movies such as Gone with the Wind, you'll recognize some of these characters here. 
um, the black musician who is being wound up yet again to play one more song, um, you know, uh, the woman who is behind him, who is a mammy figure, who is always, always kind of berating the black men to do their duty and to follow the, the master's line. On the right hand side, in just about every one of those period movies, you'll see blacks trying to affect the culture of the whites. And it's it, it's a weird thing to, to try to identify for those of you who haven't seen this. But if you have seen this before, you'll know that it's always done with a little bit of tongue in cheek. Like uh, there's almost a paternal attitude in the movies where, oh, isn't it so cute that these blacks are dressing up uh, in their finest clothes and trying to dance like us whites and uh, you know, aren't they uh, our beautiful young children that we're trying to teach or something of that sort? Or something that's a little easier to get. That Those works, by the way, came from a, an exhibition entitled Presenting Negro Scenes Drawn Upon My Passage Through the South and Reconfigured for the Benefit of Enlightened Audiences Wherever Such May Be Found by Myself, Mrs. K.E.B. Walker, colored. This one is simply titled Camp Town Ladies. In Camp Town Ladies, we see something that I think is a little bit easier to uh, to interpret. On the black back of the black woman, once again dressed in her hair skirt or her, you know, reeded skirt, is the white man as her jockey. This references the sexual assault and rape of black slaves. The, uh, you know, that treatment that uh, a black women by whites that continues, by the way, in various uh, forms of representation today. The uh, carrot that is held in front of her is, of course, the promise of something that comes with, uh, you know, joining white culture or just if you follow the rules, you know, there will be a payoff at the end. But one doesn't get the sense here that that carrot will ever be given to her or that it's in any way equitable for what she is being asked to perform. And then in the far left corner, we see uh, a rabbit, it appears, shooting at these figures. Now this is as complex as Kara Walker's work gets. The rabbit in this situation may be taken from marginalia or images of uh, illuminated manuscripts, primarily from the, the uh, medieval period where, for those of you who don't know this, these illuminated manuscripts are always passages from the Bible uh, that are very beautifully illustrated. And then in the margins around these beautifully illustrated passages, you see all kinds of demonic forms or inversions of the natural order. And one of the most common is to have something that is usually hunted, like a rabbit, become the hunter as a symbol of the inversion of the natural order of things which we see here. It's a little play off the idea that this is the natural order of things. In any case, it would be profitable for all of you at the end of this lecture to go back through some of the images and really think about you know, what resonates with you, what sense you make of them, reflecting upon uh, the way that they produce and uh, you know, deconstruct stereotypes. And, and what this, again, recalls for you, that's the reason that many of these works were made in the first place so that we have a space of reflection upon our own stereotypes that we carry around with us, uh, that we internalize, that of course provide the lenses through which we see the world. The more we're aware of them, the more that we can confront these things. Thank you and I'll see you next week.